welcome everyone uh, to my talk. I hope it's uh, very interesting. Uh, one thing I will warn you is all of these examples are actually real world examples of investigations that I have led and been involved in. So everything that you see here is absolutely real, but it has been sanitized, obviously, for national security reasons and so forth. So <clears throat> describe a bit of who I am. Uh, my background is I deal a lot in critical national infrastructure. Uh, I've uh, lectured for CPNI in the UK. I'm also a subject matter expert on water, oil and gas, and nuclear for critical infrastructure. I'm also uh, in general IT security and IoT security. And I mainly am on the offensive side, but I also do a lot of defense because I find it quite challenging, even more challenging. Uh, I love to spread the good word. I'm also on one of the uh, House of Lords groups for artificial intelligence, uh, which we meet once a month. And I'm also a think tank expert in the European Union and for the parliament. Um, before some of this, I established the Network Operations, Security Operations, Joint International Intelligence Teams, and the EU and UK GDPR uh, group for Aramco and Saudi Aramco. And before that, lots of script kidding and uh, Air Force Base Command, because I like to keep it exciting. All right, so this one's going to be just a bit of some of the introduction to the, some of the challenges that we have actually seen in the EMEA region, uh, specifically uh, the EU and East Africa. And one of the things that we have to discuss is there are certain regimes and terrorist groups that need to fund their income in some way, shape, or form. And when economic sanctions are put in place, uh, they are actually quite costly to try to monitor and enforce and also set up a lot of interesting loopholes that have to be closed on a constant basis with lots of diplomatic meetings, lots of lawyers, lots of paperwork. And it's very uncomfortable. Now, in the middle of this, in the European Union, we are about to implement something that is called the European Union General Data Protection Regulations in May, and all 28 member states are supposed to be participating in this. And it's one of these things, if you operate anywhere near the EU, you will be affected. And if you think you don't, this is actually a peering policy for um, an autonomous system that belongs to KPN Netherlands. And I highlighted peering in Europe requires peering in the US whenever possible. So even if you don't think that you're a data processor or something's going through or you don't have an office, if you have any telecommunications line or anything's going through you from Europe, you actually need to look at the EU GDPR. Lucky you, right? Yay! Um, so uh, why are sanctions important? Uh, one of the places that I have lectured, and this is kind of uh, odd, is um, uh, Urenco is a nuclear enrichment company which is owned by three governments. And what they do is they enrich uranium gas to the point where you can use it at a power plant. Right? And there's only certain grades for power plants versus weapons. Weapons, way high. Power plant, they yeah, can get away with about 7%. And uh, Urenco, Netherlands was the place that Dr. Khan stole the plants for the centrifuges. Um, two years ago, I was lecturing at Urenco, Netherlands, and in my course was a Dr. Khan. I did have to ask him if it was any relation, <laughs> which he was not, but it was very odd, very funny. But one of the things that Dr. Khan did was spread nuclear proliferation and also sell some of these plans on the black market and to various not so nice regimes at times, right? And so out of that, we have had some new agreements, one of which is called the Vassenar Agreement, which is arms, nukes, spyware, surveillance wear, monitoring wear, and so forth. Because even spyware and surveillance wear, um, if it's dual use that you can exploit, uh, you don't really want that exported to a maybe not so nice country or place. Right? So that makes sense. Right? So we have the North Koreans. Now, the North Koreans, they have a whole lot of sanctions on them. Uh, good news is for them, last week, the Russians have announced that they refuse to recognize any sanctions placed on North Korea and are again buying coal, the coal that China supposedly is no longer buying. Uh, they do a lot of different things. Um, they even have a restaurant chain around the world. 
uh, where their employees are locked in the building and only kind of stay there, live upstairs, and then they serve really bad Korean food. It's not very tasty, trust me. Um, they have some tourism, but that's been less and less because of various events. But they do have a lot of Chinese tourism, which is quite popular. Uh, another thing that we found, because I spent uh, some time in uh, East Africa, was uh, the particular location in Tanzania is very well known for ivory smuggling. And we found that they were uh, operating uh, a few things out of Tanzania. And one of the reasons is, uh, I was called down to do an investigation at this mining exploration company who dealt with gold, platinum, and uranium. And what this particular group was going after specifically, um, because they also left artifacts, which I could trace back, and also I had verified that were um, Korean, but North Korean with certain indicators from the dialects. And they were trying to steal the GIS data for the uranium exploration. And at the same time, they went ahead and planted some Bitcoin mining on the machines. Now, the only thing that stopped them from taking the uranium exploration data from Tanzania was the fact that the bandwidth was so low, so small, that they could not get these GIS pieces of data through because these are like 650 megabytes on up. They're layered uh, files. And it could not exit. They could get in, but they couldn't get the information out. So it was the only saving grace. But uh, yeah, it was uh, very, very interesting how they attempted to do it whilst also trying to fund their regime. And another thing I should mention is the last time I was there, I also found out uh, that to fund their regime, they are giving private military training to terrorist groups in certain parts of Africa. You want to learn how to make a bomb? You're not a legitimate uh, group? You can call them up now and they really do love cryptocurrency. Uh, it used to be in the past that they would get caught smuggling gold bars or ivory, but usually nothing would happen. There would be no rest, but it would be uh, taken from them. How can you carry a bunch of Bitcoin, a bunch of cryptocurrency, hard drive, phone, anything with a bit of memory, right? So now it's also changing in that respect and they're able to move more and more funds around in that manner because of it. So they no longer have to carry these big things of gold, right? Or ivory or whatever. And they also love extortion. Uh, this is a very, very serious concern because of some of the ransomware that hit the European Union and I believe also the United States last year as well. So how do I include the EU GDPR? And I do want to give a bit of an explanation for those that are not familiar with kind of the European mindset. Um, so I live in Amsterdam, and I live, gosh, about 20 minutes walk from the Anne Frank house. And one of the things that the Nazis did when they invaded the neutral country of the Netherlands was the Netherlands had a lot of data about their citizens. So they registered their citizens, they had their ethnic, ethnicity, the religion, uh, where they had come from, uh, some of their family information. So as soon as that data was available, it was misused by very naughty people. And so we have, unfortunately, things like the Anne Frank House. Right? And this is one of the reasons why, uh, between that and the Stasi, uh, that it is a uh, concern. Uh, my grandmother was actually born in East Germany and smuggled out through, uh, in the trunk of a car. And she uh, had East Germany on a birth certificate. At uh, two, uh, two and a half percent, it was estimated, of the East German population from these age rages were basically turning in their neighbors, turning in their, their loved ones, their spouses, their parents, their children. So Europe has a, a very different view on privacy. One of the reasons for the European Union is so that hopefully World War II, World War I wouldn't happen again. So. It's not just over, you know, sexy bits. I, I like cats for some reason. But um, here are some of the very important uh, articles they're called. So lawless, uh, lawfulness, is it legal to collect? Uh, I've got consent. Do you know what kind of data you're collecting and how it could possibly be used? Uh, you also have basically anything that can identify something extra special about you that you could be discriminated against. And there's a lot of coverage. It has to be transparent. So the end user licensing agreements that you have in the United States are not legal. 
with this. It has to actually be human understandable from now on. So that will be, that's a requirement now as of May. You can be the right to be forgotten. And this is a very interesting one. They actually put in the wordage that you not only have to secure your stuff at a basic level, you actually have to demonstrate it, which is quite interesting. Now, there can be consequences when you create regulations and laws. And the consequences, if you break this, can be quite powerful. It isn't just the percentage, it isn't just the level of the fine, it's also the fact that if you are a company, you all of a sudden now have to open up all of your books because they want to see what your worldwide income is. So would you want to do that with a European regulator? It's gonna be very costly, very expensive, oh no. Right? So as soon as we found out about uh, this coming down the line, when I was at Aramco, we actually started setting up a group and establish it because they did not want their books to be open. And that's understandable. They are owned by the Saudi Arabian government. So they aren't just uh, like Shell or, or something like that. So it's very different. There's also a whole lot of loopholes which uh, very interestingly, uh, I believe there's 27 or 28 listed in one of the articles. Uh, it can vary from, you are not allowed to collect basically anything from a 13 to uh, 16 year old or under. Um, also some countries have a 13 year old or under, so no more tracking kids. Um, but also if a country uh, thinks that their democratic process is being threatened, or if there's economic issues, or for the preservation of their um, uh, country, they can actually just do away with this for that time being. So there's a lot of them. But what's interesting is, it has now left a very, uh, I don't know if it works, a very, very interesting area where extortion can take place. Now, what's, uh, what's nice about this is, um, I, uh, I realized if I could find a company that was spilling out a certain amount of personally identifiable information, and I knew that they could be fined, and I knew that they would have to open their books, and if I was a bit naughty, which I am, uh, and I wanted to extort them, right, I could just say, listen, uh, you know, uh, we think that that fine might be about, I don't know, a million euro, we'll take half. And when I thought about this, I went ahead and um, last year I had the privilege to help lead the European Union uh, cyber warfare exercises in Brussels last June. And we went ahead and put this into part of the scenario, which involved ransomware and extortion. And uh, what it involved, because the European Union is very, very afraid right now, we have got Russia on one side, which isn't very friendly, and we have uh, the United States who will not affirm if they will um, agree to the NATO sub-article 5, which means if one of the NATO members comes under attack, the rest of the members will come to their aid. Now, during 9-11, the rest of the NATO allies came to the United States' aid. Uh, Mr. Trump will not reaffirm it. And because this is such a worry, part of the master scenario, the, the big one, um, involved a speech by the President of the United States. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have uh, discovered that our European allies and friends have been under attack with catastrophic consequences. However, when I visited them, I told them, I warned them that they needed to increase their military expenditure, and they did not. Now is the time for Europe to stand up on its own two feet. American blood should not be spilled. God bless, and God bless America. <laughs> so what happened for the master one, because we build up to get them used to it, and what it comprised of was uh, a minister of foreign affairs from each member state, as well as a few ambassadors, and uh, ministers of foreign affairs are like your State Department. And we also had uh, folks who like led uh, cyber commands of various countries as well. And the scenario starts, the telecommunications are hit, there is some massive extortion. Uh, the banking is taken out, one of the stock exchanges uh, is taken down. Uh, government websites causing panic, uh, stock exchange as well. But here's where it gets interesting. 
In this scenario, because we also have to be aware of critical infrastructure, which is all around us, don't we love electricity, right? Clean water that we can drink. Uh, and so in this case, there was some exposed critical infrastructure and they were able to uh, close a uh, storm surge barrier which caused a major container ship to capsize and kill all the sailors. Then they caused electricity blackouts, which ended up in the scenario, uh, causing a lot of damage and ending up killing people. It also, in the uh, scenario, exploded some transformers. And then at the very last bit, the London Underground became under attack and the attackers caused the trains during rush hour to collide into each other. So we're, we're quite concerned about some of this, as you can tell, right? <laughs> Um, and the interesting thing is we can, we can base this on reality, all right? So depending on your membership, uh, not everyone is a nuclear state within NATO. Uh, some don't admit. And so we allowed uh, the diplomats and the, the ministers and so forth uh, to decide, uh, assisting them. They could do nothing, right? They could say, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Kick out some embassy people, uh, leak some information about uh, someone in their government. There's certain things. Um, declare solidarity, which obviously we would love the US to do, but that's another story. In the Netherlands, currently I believe we're the only country that can legally hack back on any device anywhere in the world at any time that we feel like it. And uh, that's been that way for about two years, two and a half years. Um, you can declare war, and of course, nuclear deployment. So uh, to be a little dark, um, the night before we had the major exercise, uh, staff and I um, were discussing how far we thought that the participants would go, and we actually, over some wine, uh, made a little bet to see if we could get any of our groups to uh, use nuclear weapons. I'm pleased to say, my group, I convinced them to launch a nuclear weapon in the upper atmosphere of the attacking country, which happened to be North Korea, and take out all of their infrastructure. So we're quite concerned. And I think um, if it's at that level, it's, 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 it's very, very concerning. Um, the reality is, these types of things do happen. And that is a bit of a shame. These uh, various groups and regimes still need to fund their stuff, and they're going to do it in many, many different ways. So the reality is, this is why I could not carry this presentation here, because telling them I have a Saudi visa, this is an email from ISIS. This is another case that uh, I was involved in where, uh, yeah, they didn't even change like from the scent. It's from ISIS. Isn't that nice? This is from ISIS, right? So what happened was a particular embassy in a European city uh, several years ago, they had some very weak email security. Their password on the embassy email, I believe, was 123456, right? And so an extortion email was sent by that embassy to a few other embassies in that city to say, we want 25,000 euro from each one of you, coming from an official embassy website or email. That's not good, right? Nor is one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, most countries will have a separate type of police department that handles diplomatic affairs, a diplomatic corps, the diplomatic police. Because you can, uh, if you're inside an embassy, you can shoot somebody and kill them in full public view and a police officer cannot do anything because it is sovereign property of that country. There's nothing you can do. Um, so to help out, um, and I've made this mistake myself, um, the diplomatic folks got involved and went ahead and sent out a warning letter to all of the embassies. Well, at the time, uh, we did not know that the attackers still had a forwarder on the email hidden way in the back of the account. So when the diplomatic police sent this warning, uh, over the past several days, several embassies have reported to us extortion attempts. If you get any of these, please contact us. Well, this allowed the attackers to get all of the official embassy email accounts and then sent to all of the embassies and back to the diplomatic police a demand for 50 million 
And the threat was there was a very high level diplomatic event involving over 400 diplomats, including the ambassador from Japan, the ambassador from the United States, United Kingdom, you can go on their staff. And they said that they would attack and destroy it. Uh, privately, the uh, city uh, went on a bit of a freeze because there was all this going on until we were able to uh, close everything up kick them out and uh, secure the location and work on a plan with that particular country's national terrorism. Uh, so any kind of way that they can to get money, they, they do. Before they were known for their lovely beheading videos, they were extorting European companies uh, through kidnapping and so forth, big time, and had been going on for years. But they actually can use things like weak credentials, to cause a lot of damage. Uh, because of this, I was actually also put on a high value kidnap list for ISIS. And uh, so that was, I didn't tell my husband for two years, because uh, <laughs> I didn't want to scare him. But uh, yeah, these things happen, right? So uh, one of the last ones I'm, I'm going to show you, and I would love a lot of questions is, um, this one is very interesting. Um, I'm in, I'm in green, and we'll just say that this is Zakistan, is Zakistan, Arania. And uh, they, uh, they were kind enough to contact me uh, starting last year with some very, very interesting requests. They wanted me to come out and specifically teach them how to break into critical infrastructure and nuclear facilities. Complete with a VVIP tour to take me around with pictures, propaganda pictures to meet people, and a six figures for one month's work. Isn't that nice? Um, this is this year. And uh, so here's a funny one. So uh, do, do, do the very next thing, I tell this person, if my company was bigger, unless you're aware of any possible EU companies that, could, uh, that I could indirectly work for or a neutral location, I'm doing a talk on how a totally different economically sanctioned country finds funding loopholes next month. Okay, please let me know. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to work for the Zaka Iranians. Um, yeah, I don't want to be in jail. Um, so uh, these types of things actually happen, unfortunately. Uh, l luckily, I, I don't do everything for money. Um, so, but there are some solutions, absolutely. Preparation. I also found out um, in the Urban Dictionary, don't get a RAM code, meaning don't lose all of your systems because you didn't do any security. All right, don't do that. Um, everything can be vulnerable, and one of the key things is preparation, preparation, preparation as much as you can because it's not, it really isn't if it is when, okay? Um, they're going to find any possible way that they can, and the more stuff that is connected, um, hey, why not, right? They still need to buy stuff, like that uh, Scotch brand that that guy likes, you know, that kind of stuff, and you know, fly Dennis Rodman over. Uh, so there are solutions, and I also wanted to point out that from these events, uh, have the uh, new OWASP 2017, uh, the key ones that cause these events, A3, sensitive data exposure, that's a bad one, um, security misconfiguration, and uh, you would think uh, an embassy would do this, um, insufficient logging and monitoring, they, they had never even, they were using Microsoft Security Essentials, um, so, yeah, um, going back to basics can help. Understanding that you might have a particular threat profile if you have money or, or data, because that's now very, 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 very valuable is data. That is like, you know, robbing a Bitcoin exchange um, at this point. So be aware. Um, and also, um, not everyone's perfect, right? So last summer, I taught a course at Security B-Sides on how to find critical vulnerabilities 
in the CIA, GCHQ, NSA, and the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the NSA was nice enough to fix this particular vulnerability within eight hours. Um, but they themselves had a vulnerable asset up that was uh, vulnerable to actually an, a crypto attack, which would have been a little embarrassing. Um, so be aware, no one's perfect, right? But it was the best response I've ever gotten from responsible disclosure. Man, I'm telling you, I told them that night, by 10.30 in the morning, everything was fixed. It was great. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Um, basic security testing, just keep it simple. Uh, sometimes if you try to overcomplicate things or get that mystery magical box that some vendor says can do everything, it also nowadays still needs to be audited to make sure that it can do the things that it promises and it's not sending data this way or that way or automatically profiling an individual based on some special thing, gender, sexual orientation, so on and so forth. I also highly suggest uh, knowing who uh, you can get help from because if a large event occurs in your organization, um, your company might need some help to bring it back up. There are other people's jobs on the line, for example, and you don't want your company to fail. Um, so they can help. And they also have a lot of good material. And one of the things that uh, helped us um, was at the time, uh, part of the time when I was at Aramco, uh, the Dutch CERT wasn't really ready for private business. So we went ahead and leveraged Luxembourg, which has possibly one of the best CERTs I've ever worked with. They're called the Circle Team. And we went ahead and put uh, a couple of uh, DNS servers into racks to be able to be co a constituent. And then we had a particular event uh, that involved the North Koreans and a nuclear facility. And they were able to uh, help us out uh, quite a bit as well uh, because we needed some additional assistance immediately. So they can be very, very helpful. So get to know where you can get some help because the last thing you want to do is if you lose everything, like at the Aramco situation, they had everything on SharePoint, they had nothing printed out, so who do you call, right? So don't be that, don't get Aramco. So it can be done. Definitely keep it simple. One of the best ways is if you do collect any of this, try to anonymize it. And that's uh, probably the quickest and cheapest way. You can do that with scripts, all sorts of things. Uh, and that's one of the things that we did at Aramco as well. Obviously, include both of these things, especially the fact that we know that extortion is getting worse and worse. And unfortunately, I advise everyone to have some Bitcoin ready. Because if you're in a situation where maybe even a, a cert might advise you, they're only asking for a small amount. But I don't agree with that, personally because we've seen in Sweden a couple of years ago, they uh, did a similar thing to part of the telecom system. And the Swedish, I think it was Sweden, the, the government kind of pressured them to pay the ransom and then the group was like, okay, give me more. And you don't want to be in that situation. That's how like, a lot of, of blackmail occurs, always more and more and more, all right? Because they know you have the money. So I put some uh, resources up and also stress, be careful who you do business with. <laughs> um, I put in uh, the US cert. This one is very good. It comes out of Europe and what they have is for free um, all of these exercises, something like 37 exercises complete with virtual machines. They have a student edition and a teacher edition. So one module could be uh, getting to know your law enforcement or something like that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you guys, yeah, because you guys have them. Yeah. They, they, they have them. Oh, no, I was pointing to the OWASP people. They're recording everything. Absolutely. Um, so I found this very, very good. Fantastic resource. And another one that you might not have heard of over here, this one is called the Malware Information Sharing Platform. And what it does is uh, it collects uh, the newest and greatest malware hashes from certs around the world, and you can actually feed those in before antivirus is available. So it can give you an edge, and it's free, and it's on GitHub. So it's great. And you can kind of stay ahead to a certain extent, especially if your risk profile is a bit nation-y statey. So you know, that, that can help. So in closing, oh, I guess that didn't work. Um, anyway, 
Shit happens. IT's in it. They might be after you, as well as this is some of the subdomains I found. They, they changed it uh, after I reported it to the NSA. Those were actual subdomains. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you you got to have fun with security, right? You know? uh, there are a lot of resources that are available out there. So you don't have to have this huge, huge spend. It is out there. All right. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And now I am ready for questions and eager. We got a question back here. Shout Probably shout. I'd love to shout. Test, test. Cool. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Uh, other than the usual suspects, your Russia's, your Iran's, your China's, your North Korea's, who do you see as being sort of the the threat that we should be most worried about? And is if that is cyber crime, what do we do when the FBI and the other law enforcement agencies are frankly tapped out and they're really not necessarily going to give us the time of day? Uh, they, they have been rather tapped out, uh, which is a bit of a concern because a lot of uh, governmental organizations have been leaning, quite frankly, a bit too heavily on like uh, US CERT to kind of take care of security for them, uh, which is a bit of a problem, all right? Uh, it depends on your risk profile. So most organizations are going to be facing a lot of stuff from uh, cybercrime, any way that they can make money. So you might have the ransomware, uh, extortion stuff uh, like that, or um, moving into seeing if they can find something that they can extort you for. Right? Uh, there are other organizations out there that operate very large um, uh, crimeware systems. For example, uh, in Indonesia, uh, probably the world's largest Biker Gang uh, comes out of Indonesia. Uh, they actually have a complete network uh, that runs, and they take advantage of the vast bandwidth in parts of Europe to stage their stuff from. So it, it isn't you know, just them or, or the scarier people. There are a lot of little groups out there that want to fund and come up with money. And those, I would say, uh, they, they've refined it to a very, a very high skill level because that's how they're getting a lot of money. So I, most cases, I'd be more worried about that, except if your risk profile includes a bit more of this. But random, like uh, ransomware and hitting low-hanging fruit, that's easy. They'll also participate in that. So trying to take care of some of your low-hanging fruit, check out your stuff on like Census or Shodan or whatever, do a quick you know, search, and then you're probably going to meet a good basic level. That's my advice. Questions, questions? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm curious if you know, um, did these regimes turn to these crime techniques after the sanctions were implemented and they could no longer make money in the legitimate way? And is that kind of complicit it, there? Yeah, it's one of the shifts. And so there's various ways that when you apply uh, economic sanctions on a country, they'll start branching out. And it's just now we have the joy of the digital world that makes it a lot easier to do, right? Definitely. See one back there? Yeah, thanks for sharing the uh, GDPR extortion example. My question is related to uh, if somebody actually considered paying that and delaying um, find or de delaying information going to the EU GDPR, what, is there anything in the GDPR that would increase their um, risk or right um, uh, there, there is uh, on top of the uh, EU GDPR uh, there's also a system per country where uh, the data commissioner of that country can uh, if you've been very very bad stop you from ever exporting or importing data to that country again so you, uh, you'll lose a, something called a, a, a data transfer certificate. So you're basically stuck in that country, which would be very, very bad. So that's one of the more extreme penalties. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just how is it enforced? 
does uh, you have to take them to court and then there's a long drawn out legal battle or no. they can just do it from a regulatory regulatory and they, and they have enforcement they have yes. uh, actual resources to be yes. able to well not everyone um, I don't think uh, say Albania is quite ready yet uh, the Netherlands is. Uh, the United Kingdom certainly is. They actually started finding people and they had their own uh, set of rules about two years uh, previous. So they've already had that enforcement. They've been fining uh, like a million quid in one case. Uh, so they're, they're already there. After Brexit, will they still be doing the... Well, they, have their, uh, they had their own original law, so what they're probably going to do is shift back to that. Uh, at least that was the indication I got from the Information Commissioner uh, about a week and a half ago in the UK. Questions, questions? With all of the data living in the cloud now, how can the EU regulators really keep up with it? I mean, Microsoft Azure is everywhere. Data is everywhere. Uh, Microsoft doesn't necessarily even know where it is. It's just in their cloud. So it could be in Ireland, it could be in Israel, it could be in Indiana. I like I. Um, you know, who knows where it is? So, so how is that effective? And if the EU decides to clamp down on someone, how can they, and I'm not trying to, to pick, just, just how, how would one stop it from... Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. One of the things that uh, cloud providers like Microsoft have now agreed to is any of the European data, you actually uh, have transparency where your data is actually stored. And if they break that, then that's a violation. Uh, however, in reality, we all know that data moves a, a little bit of everywhere, right? So uh, it's a bit of a problem. Um, they're going to have a very big job. There's going to be a lot of new lawyers, a lot of new lawsuits. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I see this as being very problematic. There have already been member states who have kind of asked, can we delay this because we definitely are not ready. Uh, we don't have the enforcement re, you know, resources or we might have just set up a, an information commission with five people. What are you going to do with that? You can't do much. So there are already uh, reservations. And I believe from uh, some of the talks I've attended that there will be a, 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 a more friendly transition period so they aren't going to try to hammer you right away. But I'm sure with very egregious situations, they would. Yes, sir. that uh, operate digital services uh, globally and um, EU citizens essentially use those digital services, uh, but they're typically a U.S. company. Um, suggestions on you know, how to prepare for GDPR and what's your sense of when, when, when there's going to be a bellwether case where a U.S. company is going to oh, yeah. be actually brought in front of GDPR and the articles that you mentioned? Absolutely. Um one of the ways that they've already been kind of restricting things uh, in Europe is, are you an EU resident or citizen or not? And so that is put into a, a different uh, container uh, or database so that it's only stored a certain amount of time and it might be anonymized in a different way. Uh, so they've already started planning for that. And that is a, a good suggestion if you have that option because that's perfectly legal to ask, you know, are you an EU resident or a citizen because when I you know, try to buy certain things here, oh, you must be a U.S. resident. Well, I'm not, right? Um, so that's perfectly legal. Um, the second part? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. In, in, in light of the, the GDPR and, of course, you know, the, the prevailing legislation in the United States, which is GLBA, which has traditionally been kind of the U.S. privacy law. Uh, it's probably going to be a biggie uh, because there are several uh, governments that are currently investigating Facebook, and one of them is the Dutch because they uh, also have a separate thing for 13 and under, which is now illegal to track, and a few other small bits. So um, personally, I think they would go after a bigger company that has the funds first. Deep pockets. Right, wouldn't you? Right? 
So I'm going to have to wrap up because I got the wrap up sign. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you all. So oh, Wasp for uh, bringing me out here and hosting me. And I'll be available for any other questions right after. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.